Kohli from Ayur Hitam. Friday, that time of the day again, coming up with a new topic based upon Ayurveda. I hope you're all having a fun day if you're living in the West Coast and if you're in, especially in the Bay Area, the skies have finally cleared up and I can actually see the blue sky. Last week was scary with the orange sky and everything, but now it's blue sky, the quality is good, air quality is good, we're able to go out and uh, enjoy them I mean, and we take so many things for granted now um, now nature is reminding us again and again few things that we cannot take it for granted and show gratitude towards so many things that we're blessed upon every day yeah so having said that today's topic is going to be about uh, uh, chronic acidity it's a very very common um, topic a lot of people you know, in various degree, suffer from it. So I thought it would be a good idea to um, talk about it. And if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to ask me questions anytime in between or even at the end, uh, depending on how the flow is going, I might choose to answer your questions at the end of the topic. But uh, yeah, that's how it's going to be. So with the acidity, it's like, you know, it's like a nagging problem, right? It's not like uh, something where you're really suffering from something, you have to take care of it right now. No, it's not like that. You have, you're like normal person, you go out, you talk with friends, everybody, you go out and you do your normal life. But then something is always nagging in the background, like, oh, what if I eat this? What if I do this? What if I go out? What if I don't sleep on time? So it's like that nagging problem, which doesn't completely hinder your life, but then it's there. So those things, usually what happens is unless they come at you right in front of you and say, hey, take care of me right now. Until then, we try to push it away until it comes right in front of us, right? I mean, nature has given us so many examples right now. That only if it comes in front of us we take care of it this is one of those kinds too where we choose not to address it right so that's why i wanted to address more about it let's more talk about the reasons to why it happens the number one reason is definitely undigested food or having less digestive fire in the body you if you have listened to my talks in the past, you have probably heard this in the past that having less digestive fire is what creates a lot of problems. And this is one of them. And we'll find out how it happens, right? So mainly it's a sour taste. That's what disrupts already whatever is happening already. There is undigested food in the body. The sour taste it would, would disrupt the most. So really, when we talk about incompatible foods, we have spoken about this in the past. Mainly, you know, if you're eating hot and cold foods together, example, like that famous ice cream and gulab jamun combination, right? So those things, if you're doing that, then definitely there's going to be a problem. Or if you're, eat, if you're in AC and if you go out, and it's it's uh, very hot outside, then also there's going to be a problem. Or if you're showering right after you eat food, then that's a problem, right? Or milkshakes. These are all incompatible foods. These are all comes under incompatible category. So that's one category. And the next category is foods that are very very heating you know they go inside our body they doesn't digest immediately usually it should take about two to three hours for any food to digest but if we are constantly eating that kind of foods which does not digest fast enough and they sit in our body and they ferment inside the body for example pizza which has a lot of cheese in it 
um, and heavy sweets or vinegar, kombucha, or any kind of, um, uh, you know, very, very fried foods, heavy, heavy foods that takes a long time for them to digest. So that's another culprit. Another culprit is the kombucha that I was just talking about that comes in the sour category. If you're eating a lot, you know, sour and salt are two things that actually increases a lot of heat in the body compared to even spicy food. We always think, oh, if we eat spicy food, it creates a lot of heat. Salt and um, sour foods, they actually create much more heat. So analyzing what kind of sour foods we're eating in our daily food. The number one uh, culprit that I see a lot is yogurt. Then uh, we look at sour fruits or kombucha or vinegar or anything else that's fermented. So check if that's what in your diet. And again, if you do it just one day, two days for fun, it does not. I mean, we, do, we shouldn't be freaking out. Oh my God, I should never touch it. That's not what I'm talking about. If we are doing it for a longer time, then that's going to be a problem, right? And then if we're eating food that's not necessarily good, not necessarily good means food that's stale, which is overnight, which is kept overnight. That's specifically mentioned that if you eat that kind of food, then we will be succumbed to this kind of problems of less digestive fire and acidity kind of problems. And if you're eating foods more than your capacity, you're full, but your mental hunger is still not full and you want to eat. When If you eat more, then again, you're not digesting it well. So then it stays there and it ferments and that's what happens, right? So these are the physical causative factors. If we talk about the mental causative factors, you know, we say that um, don't have a heartburn when someone is doing good if we're jealous about them, we say, don't have a heartburn towards them, right? It's because our gut is the second mind. It holds all the emotions. And each emotion has a quality. So if you're showing that negative quality of either increased anger, or if there is jealousy, if there is that kind of irritation, these three things increases the quality of heat in the body and that goes and it stays in our stomach. So that's another biggest causative factor that can lead to acidity. But then what is acidity, right? There's so many different categories of things. There's so many different symptoms that fall under the purview of acidity. We broadly classify them as acidity, but each one of us experience different symptoms. Let's understand what happens. So if we're doing these causative factors that I just listed, either physical or mental, if we're doing this for a long time, then yes, we're putting a lot of a um, lot of pressure and a lot of effort for our digestive function. Then it gives up one day or it slows down because it has to continuously keep on digestion. What is, what is digestion? What happens when we're digesting? All these acids that are present in our body are being released, right? And when they stay, when, they, when it stays for a longer time, it ferments. And what happens if the fermented layer is always in your stomach? Imagine if you have there is a, uh, why is my tummy bulging? Why is my tummy holding? Why is my heart? Very good question, Salmia. I'll come to that for sure. So imagine there is a, if you have a pot, a yogurt pot, right? And you're cleaning that yogurt pot. When you're trying to clean that yogurt pot and when you don't clean it properly, there is a layer that's formed. There's a layer that's left, just a small layer of yogurt that's left on a pot, right? Then what you do is 
you just put milk in that pot, not knowing that there's yogurt. Understand that next day it will curdle. The whole milk will curdle. Just because there is a small speck of yogurt you missed when you're cleaning. That's exactly what happens in our tummy. There is a layer of that acidic residue that's left in our tummy. And even though you mil you drink milk, it will curdle at one point, not all the time. So there's going to be two stages. There is an attack stage and there is a non-attack stage. Usually a non-attack stage is in such a way that we're barely holding the ship. It's like we're eating, but we're eating carefully and we're barely making it without any symptoms. But then once we take a small causative factor, it could be very, very minute thing and you suddenly see there's a flare up and you're like, you're wondering, oh my God, all these years I have been eating this, but I've never had a problem. Just because I turned into 30s or 40s or 50s now, my digestive function has gone down and see, even with this small thing, I'm having this reaction. That's usually what we tend to. We say, oh, I'm getting old. This is a normal phenomena. That's what we try to justify. But not understanding that because we have done this all these years, not knowing that there is a layer that is formed inside our tummy, even a slightest of a causative factor can flare up, can give you reaction. So we have to go back and dig all those years, right? So not paying attention during a non-attack stage is going to hurt us. You know, in the textbooks, they have actually written this word, an unintelligent person will continue to take the causative factors, whatever the, either the causative factors of eating or drinking and continuously increase that layer. That's what's written in the textbook. So we have to understand the causative factors very, very well first and remove that causative factors. That's the first step. And understand what our symptoms are, because it's again, a wide variety of symptoms that we experience. One variety of experience, uh, one variety of um, symptoms that we experience are going to be like bloating. There's going to be excessive pain. We experience pain in the region. We experience headache. This is because we have eaten foods that have increased the air element in the body which has created the undigested food predominant of the air element. And any trigger, any causative factor can create these kind of symptoms, even pain in the chest, like you're having a heart attack. That also we related to, oh, acidity, right? This is because understand that the causative factors that we have given are in such that they create these kind of symptoms with a slightest of a causative factor. The second type is burning. There's going to be intense burning either in your stomach or in your esophageal region, or there's going to be diarrhea, or there's going to be sour burps, sourness that comes up, or acidity that comes up. All of that yucky kind of feeling that you feel all around the chest region or in your stomach region. That's because you have been giving a lot of heat increasing symptoms. When you're consuming either physically or mentally, it's more heat increasing symptoms. And this is actually a blast, like a nuclear blast that happens because you're feeding the causative factor directly and any small causative factor will create a nuclear blast and you will feel all of these symptoms suddenly. The third type of symptoms where you feel heaviness, you're like tired, lethargic, you don't feel like doing anything, you don't feel like eating anything, you feel very tired. That's because you've been giving a lot of mucus increasing foods like the cheese we spoke about, the ice cream we spoke about, the fried foods we spoke about, the heavy foods we spoke about, and any slightest causative factor that increases the heat along with this undigested food will create, it's like 
it's like a crash. You can't even move. It's like all your body is very, very heavy for you to even carry, right? So I have spoken extensively about what the causative factors are, what the symptoms are. Now we have to talk about affect skin and cause magnesium or calcium deficiency. Very correct, Bhargavi. I will address that. Um, now that you're actually asking that, Bhargavi, I want to address that right now. The chronic acidity, when we have we have spoken about the symptoms where there is excessive sourness that we experience upwards, right? There could be symptoms where you feel nauseous and where you feel vomiting. And sometimes you might even vomit bile. We're so scared when we vomit bile or we're so scared when there is a sour burps coming up, when there's nausea coming up, where we then resort to antiemetics. Quickly reduce whatever is experiencing upwards. When we give that antiemetics, the toxins that are actually trying to go out upwards, we're saying them, no, 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 don't go upwards. I want you to suppress. I want you to just stay inside. So they're staying inside. Now they either try to go downwards. We it, it can cause a diarrhea kind of symptoms. It might cause burning in the anal region. It might cause diarrhea in this in the anal region. Then we give antidiarrheals to stop that. We're like, nope, don't go from that route. Also, I want you to stay in. Because we're afraid, you know. Oh my God, so many um, loose tools. I'm going to lose my energy. I, I want to stop it. Then the toxins that are there are desperate to go out. When they're desperate to go out, they choose the route of skin. That's when I see a lot of clients being um, erupting in skin conditions. There's a lot of skin conditions that are seen either as eczema or as big blisters that are seen on the skin especially if this is going on for a longer time because the toxins are trying to go out from a different route. Yes, that is what happens. That's one phenomena that happens. And the second thing about magnesium and calcium deficiency is because there is a lot of acid, whatever food you give is being burnt up. It's not being assimilated properly. It's like the forest fire that's outside. There's a lot of fire but we are not able to use it. It's not being channelized properly. So there's a lot of acid inside the body and that acid quickly chars the food that we give. So burning it into ashes and we're not able to absorb the nutrients that are present in the food that is given to the body. We carefully read all the uh, ingredients in the in the nutrients that is given to us in the food that is given to us whatever food we take we look at how much protein how much carbohydrates how much minerals what is present in it but we're forgetting to see is that being digested is that being absorbed so that could be a reason where a calcium and magnesium deficiency can happen yeah thank you for bringing that up so again resorting to antiemetics or antidiarrheals when you're having that symptoms frequently is definitely not a good idea. When I'm talking about the, uh, uh, thank you so much, Ratna. Thank you for joining. When I'm talking about the treatment, the very first treatment that is given is actually vomiting. If you feel like vomiting, you induce, you even induce vomiting and you vomit out whatever is coming out. So you're removing the toxins. Yeah, so that's the first, first treatment that's given. And the second treatment is to do fasting. Intermittent fasting is very, very famous these days that a lot of people have been uh, doing. But this has been mentioned many, many years ago in Ayurveda textbooks. Thank you so much, Jayashree. Uh, that intermittent fasting is definitely very, very beneficial. We spoke about all the causative factors. And we spoke about how this causative factors make home inside. When we And we also spoke about an attack stage and a non-attack stage. We take care of the situation when there is an attack stage, when the situation is, when we're actually seeing symptoms. But when it is dormant, it is sleeping, 
we forget that we have to address it. That's when we should not rest and we should take care of it, especially during non-attack stage. Make sure you do some kind of fasting. Yeah, the famous moon soup fasting that I speak about all the time. It's uh, the recipe is on my website. And if you have any questions about that, you can ask that is you can actually be on that for three days in a row and remove all the undigested toxins that are present. And the second thing you can also be on, depending upon what is happening inside your body, is to be on buttermilk, freshly made buttermilk. Again, I am repeating, not store-bought buttermilk, but the yogurt has to be made fresh at home. And you make fresh buttermilk and you just drink buttermilk throughout the day whenever you're hungry. And it might be magical that it that itself can take care of a lot of um, acidity to shoot up because of her body hunger. Absolutely. I'll talk about that, Jayshree. So uh, that is another option. Or just being on warm water. That is one option. Or depending upon how much capacity you have, because not all of us have that capacity to fast throughout the day. And we don't want your tissues to suffer. So, so that your tissues doesn't suffer, you can give one meal. You can give one meal as your regular food and you can have soups at for dinner. That's one more thing. Again, it's extremely important to take care of non-attack stage. Another treatment that can be done, um, and Jayshree, I'll take your question now. Can intermittent fasting cause uh, acidity to shoot up because our body is hungry for food and producing the acids for the food that's not provided that day? Very, very correct. So our digestive fire usually comes up at certain times of the day, thinking that we're going to give it food. So the reason we do intermittent fasting and the reason I told you these many different varieties of intermittent fasting, there is not just one variety that will work for everybody. It is different for different people. It is different according to the amount of energy you have, according to the amount of strength that you have and according to the strength of the toxins inside the body. So let's say acids come up. Acids meaning the digestive fire, right? That comes up during certain times to digest your food. It will look for food and it will not find food. Then what will it digest? It will digest your toxins. And once the toxins are done, if there's no more toxins, that's when it will look for food and if there is no food then it will start digesting your own tissues so the soup that we spoke about gives it very very light food so that our fire is not completely engrossed in digesting the food it is given enough fuel your fire is given enough fuel so that it can sustain while it is working on digesting the toxins that are present. So that is why it is important that we provide it some kind of fuel. I'm not saying you're going to be fasting without eating anything at all. You are going to be fasting by giving it enough food for it to sustain, for the digestive fire to sustain, so that it can do the work of removing the undigested toxins. I hope that made sense. And the reason acidity shoots up when um, you don't eat food it's because you know the heat inside fire always goes up fire always likes to go up when you see fire always when you do yagya anytime fire has the quality of going up all the time so if there's not enough undigested toxin there and if it does not have enough fuel then it's so much it's like the the fire is not channeled enough and it's going haywire and it's going outside the stomach and it can reach the esophagus and the esophageal region has a different type of physiology compared to your stomach so when it reaches there then you feel that burning and you feel that acidity so by giving it its fuel you're channelizing it in such a way that the fire stays in the stomach only and it will be able to digest whatever 
uh, toxins that are present in the stomach. Yeah, so that's the reason we can take care of acidity also. And uh, another important thing is amla is one of the herb that is very, very good that you can use for your um, daily use. You know, Moravala, like the amla that you can get, the pieces, amla pieces that you can get, you can keep on chewing on them. Or you can get the very good amalaki churna, the, the powder of amla, and you can make a paste of it along with honey, and you can take up to half a teaspoon every day along with honey. And it will take care of, you know, that's the only, um, Amla is the only thing that even though it is sour, it is not heating. So you can definitely use that. That's one safe. I usually do not um, say out any herbs to be used because it might hurt. But this is something that is general and it can be used. It, it is actually given as a food also. It's like a food item also. So you can safely use that. Hi, Swati. Thank you for joining. Another thing that um, we spoke about is that gut is our second brain or second mind, right? So we also spoke about how it stores all the stresses and anxiety. We must do something to reduce that stresses and anxiety. We must do something uh, that uh, is sustainable. You know, we hear about it all, reduce your stress, reduce your anxiety. We all know this psychologically, but it's that extra step that we need to take to take care of ourselves. Um, do some kind of meditation or anything you like, you know, some kind of drawing, singing, whatever meditative way you can go to for reducing your stresses and reducing your anxiety so that that hot emotions that hot quality inside will reduce and definitely eating good quality grains uh, good quality grains rice and wheat are known for ages i mean they have been sustained for so many thousands of years so those two are some things that you can safely consume uh, definitely rice which is an year old or even wheat that's a year old is always good to consume and usually Indian stores that's what they carry um, and uh, barley is another thing that you can safely consume moong is a best pulse that you can consume the best friends for you are is bitter taste because acidity and bitter when they're combined it becomes a sweet taste so uh, including bitter gourd or including snake gourd. These are good vegetables that you can include in your diet. And even um, good things like, you know, winter melon is a good uh, vegetable that you can include. Squashes, all squashes are good. And uh, you can uh, include uh, all the, you know, uh, any bittery stuff that's that's available, you can use them. Yeah, so that's one thing that I wanted to talk about. And always drinking warm water. You know, we have this tendency of drinking cold water because we think there's acidity and uh, because there's heat and I want to reduce that heat with cold. That's our natural tendency, right? Yes, you will feel if you have that episode of acidity and if you drink either cold milk or cold water you feel like ah it feels a lot better right but then if you continue doing that you are suppressing your digestive fire so in a long run the problem is not fixed so i encourage you to drink warm boiled water only all the time especially if it is steeped with some kind of herbs like cumin, coriander, fennel, you know, these things that you can steep the water with, boil it and drink that. Even though you feel acidic, even though you feel very hot, especially if you're feeling the symptoms at that time, you know, the best thing to do is, I mean, pomegranate juice is okay uh, because it is a little bit cooling and you feel good when you drink that. It's okay. But in general, even though intuitively it feels like cold things might help you, but in a long run, because of all the factors that we spoke about, they're going to hurt you. So do not resort to cold foods or cold drinks or um, anything cold. 
use only warm things because you want your environment you want your stomach to be in that warm environment right and another thing that you can also do is uh, soak coriander seeds overnight and drink that water in the morning to reduce that heat uh, the idea is definitely to reduce the heat in the body and to remove the toxins so these are the two um, mantras that needs to be done after drinking hot water after two hours after dinner i feel hungry okay so you drink hot water two hours after dinner maybe your dinner is not enough swati maybe you're not eating enough dinner that could be one of the reasons mm, or um, yeah, it depends upon how much hot water you're drinking you feel hungry uh, before going to bed you can definitely drink a warm cup of milk that's definitely okay um, citrus citrus Fruits like lemons and oranges, when digested, becomes alkaline, so the help with acidity. Is that true? Actually, not, Jayashree. Um, so they, uh, in Ayurveda, there is a concept called potency, uh, how the foods are converted into. And uh, anything citrus, once consumed, it is going to be converted into a hot potency and anything hot converting into to hot is not a good idea for the body so unless it is a very sweet orange i would request not to consume those uh, like i said the two things that are even though they are um, sour but they have cold potency are amalaki amla gooseberry and pomegranate these are the two things that can be consumed and uh, even though it is citrusy even though it is sour it is cold potency ice cream are okay swati yes definitely once in a while is okay but if you are uh, chronically if you're suffering from acidity then um, to to support your digestive fire ice cream is not going to support your digestive fire it's actually going to suffer your digestive fire so you can have it once in a while when the sun is at its high at its peak and away from your meals you can just have it for fun so um that's that's one thing and i also wanted to speak reiterate about the don'ts definitely do not suppress the vomitus if it's happening it's the biggest mistake and stay away from spicy foods yogurt smoothies fried foods alcohol we've spoken about that and uh, um, don't have heartburn towards others. That's one thing that we have to um, mark and keep. Uh, we forget, we usually do all the physical things, but all these subtle things we forget. So I'm reminding again and again. And uh, when I was doing this talk, I had a suggestion. I actually, um, uh, one of my very close friends who's a nephrologist, he's asked me to talk about how PPIs right now they're actually available over the counter when I started um, being a pharmacist 15 years ago they were not available over the counter the proton pump inhibitors they were not um, available over the counter but right now they are there's a lot of changes that happened so they what does these do right they go and they block the receptors that release acid that's really what they do so they're stopping from the acid being produced from the acid not being produced so um and the biggest problem that, that because he's a nephrologist i was surprised when he said that 25 percent of his practice he sees that people come with renal problems because of taking long-term proton pump inhibitors so again we are suppressing the problem but not addressing from the root cause because it is available over the counter and because we think that just popping a pill is easier we can suppress the symptoms and we can happily uh, take care of the problem at that point i um, advise you to look at that phenomena one more time to look at what's the long-term benefit and what's the long-term risk i would uh, encourage you to make that balance for yourself especially when i saw i heard that i knew that there is a problem but when i heard that his practice has 25 percent 
um, patients he see are because of long-term PPIs. That's a huge number. Um, so that's one thing that I wanted to also bring up. And I've also gotten a request to speak about hiatal hernia. I did see the request here. I don't feel jealous, but have acidity. Swati, so then it's not necessary that uh, acidity is caused because of jealousy. Definitely not. Maybe the degree of acidity, your acidity is reduced because you don't have that feelings. So all the causative factors, it is not necessary that um, all of them are present. It depends upon what causative factor you've been taking, right? I've uh, listed a few causative factors that are very common, but there are many more that it will be difficult for me to say in this um, setting of limited time. But it's not necessary that um, the mental causative factor, like the feeling jealousy, is the only reason for acidity, but that can also contribute. That is what I wanted to say. Uh, other people have jealousy, but they don't have acidity. A <laughs> very nice observation. Um, maybe it is being manifested in a different part of their body, right? So um, anytime our uh, qualities, our mental, uh, our mental qualities that we have are then converted into physical qualities, then they stay in our body and they harbor in a very, very weak part of our body they find a weak part of our body, right? So they could be experiencing something else that we're not able to see. Yeah. So again, it's not true that everybody who's jealous experiences acidity. And it's also not true that everybody that has acidity have to be experiencing acidity just because of jealousy. But that's one of the causative factor I just wanted to highlight. So true about the mental health and acidity. Yes, Jayashree. What is a PPI? Yeah, thank you for asking, Swati. Mm, I thought because it's available over the counter and I just said it as a matter of fact, but thank you for bringing that up. PPI is a proton pump inhibitor, famously available as omeprazole, pantoprazole, nexium, esomeprazole. There's all these azoles that are available. What they do is they go inside when when they're administered inside our body they go and they stop this the the inhibitors right the name suggests that they stop a receptor which produces acid in our stomach acid production some kind of acid production is required we need uh, we need fire in our stove for us to make food without any fire there's no way we're going to cook anything we're not able to cook anything so definitely fire is required but is it channelized fire or is it the fire that is going away without any direction like a forest fire is the question so what this ppis do is they reduce the amount of acid that is being produced they block those receptors so that um, the amount of acid that's being produced will be reduced and you will uh, most likely immediately feel relief from the symptoms, depending upon what kind of symptoms you're experiencing. However, there are long-term effects, long-term problems with the PPI. And one of that is renal problems. And out of those, there's many, many more. I mean, abdominal pain is one more. Um, constipation could be another thing. And gastrointestinal problems could be another thing. There's several other things, but then um, I just highlighted the renal concern today. I hope that answered your question. And uh, one more thing I wanted to speak about, uh, I got a request to speak about hiatal hernia because I was speaking about acidity as well. So a brief introduction of what hiatal hernia is. You can actually ask me any questions, any of you that's present, if you have any questions um other than um in, out of the topic also or towards the topic you can definitely ask while i'm speaking about this so really hiatal hernia is you know you have that the food that we consume briefly i just wanted to give you a background the food that we consume it goes inside from the esophagus and it has to go into the stomach so there's an opening for the pipe to go from the esophagus to the stomach there's a hole right and it's uh, being governed by a muscle called diaphragm diaphragm is present 
So as there is a lot of pressure inside our stomach, there is going to be increase in the um, you know expansion of the stomach that can happen. The hole that's present between the esophagus and stomach makes sure that this food, once it enters in the stomach, does not come up. The food just has to go downwards and stay in the stomach so that it stays there for some time and digest there. But it should not come up. However, because of the increased pressure, could be for several reasons that we just mentioned, or it could be some mechanical problems that has happened. Then what happens is the food that is supposed to stay in the stomach comes upwards from that hole. And because the pH that is inside the stomach is different, it is more acidic. And it goes up when it reaches the esophagus, the, the structure that is present in the esophagus cannot handle that pH and it starts burning because it's burning for that structure over there physiologically. So that's called the GERD, that's famously called the gastrointestinal reflux. That's the reflux, the food is coming upwards. So as it is being pushed upwards so many times, there is a possibility that this hole increases in its diameter and can result in hiatal hernia. Again, this is one of the reasons, it is not the reason. So how to correct it? I know PPIs, proton pump inhibitors that we just spoke about are one of the things that are given and uh, H2 blockers are other things. Again, both of them are acid suppressing. If that's not an alternative, if that doesn't work, the next alternative is to give steroids to suppress again, right? And if that doesn't work, then another alternative is to mechanically correct it, really go inside, do a small surgery and mechanically correct it. That's another way of correcting it. And I'm talking about allopathic way of uh, taking care of it. I was asked to address it. How can we take care of it Ayurvedically? Going back to addressing what has caused it in the first place. I have addressed all the causative factors. You can go back and listen to all the causative factors that I have um, uh, listed here. If those causative factors have been there for a longer time, chances are the pressure, because the undigested toxins are present in the stomach for a longer time, the pressure could be increasing and that could be a causative factor. So, um, all along with all the treatment that we spoke about, there's going to be specific herbs that can be given to take care of the undigested toxins that are present. And uh, following the diet and lifestyle that will not accumulate more undigested food also helps. So I hope that has answered your question. Uh, taking proton pump inhibitors and H2 blockers and steroids is unfortunately not an answer for a long term. It could be causing some other things. So understanding for anything, there is no smoke without fire. For anything, you have to go and find out what the root causes and correct it that way. I hope that has answered your question. So Swati, I think you're asking what are the alternatives to PPI, all the protocol that we just spoke about. And uh, yes, there are some Ayurvedic herbs that can take care of the root cause and removing that pressure, removing that acidic environment. We spoke about how the pot is being, uh, you know, it is covered with a layer of yogurt. That's how it is. We can remove that layer in our abdomen. Uh, and that's how we're, we can do with our Ayurvedic herbs. And that's the alternative. Is there an immediate remedy to suppress acidity naturally? A lot of people take Tums, for example. Is there anything we could take naturally to suppress the immediate harsh acidic feeling? Absolutely, Jayshree. Um, so the Amla that I was talking about actually does a magic on the, um, the Amla pieces that you get. You get Amla pieces and you just suck on it. Keep sucking on it and that reduces the acidity immediately. 
uh, buttermilk could be another reason. And uh, like I said, because acidity is a broader term, we have spoken about different symptoms that people can experience. Uh, right. So th this is again, I'm assuming that there is uh, esophageal reflux. There is actually food that's coming up and you're feeling sour and you're feeling that burning. So reducing that burning, uh, definitely if you can take some the the coriander water that we spoke about, you can soak coriander water and drink that uh, water. You can soak it for two to three hours and drink that water. Uh, uh also amla you can take half a teaspoon of amla along with honey that's another thing that can immediately reduce um, acidity you'll be surprised usually people say ayurveda takes a long time to act yes it will take a long time to take care of the root cause but if there is any um thing that's coming up like uh, uh you know that like an acute condition it will immediately take care of it so the amla we spoke about, um, and we spoke about uh, buttermilk. We also spoke about soaked coriander water, you know, like a teaspoon of coriander. Uh, you can soak it in um, at least 100 ml of water for overnight is best, best but uh, if not, at least for three to four hours and drinking that water. Uh, this will actually help with, uh, uh, with reduction. Yeah, Tums is again suppressing what is coming because it is, um, you know, calcium, it uh, it reacts with the acid and makes it a compound and helps it. Um, I mean, once in a while is okay, but I wouldn't want anyone to continuously take it. Yeah. That's it for today that I wanted to share. But if you have any questions, thank you, Jayshree. If you have any other questions, even other than acidity also, I'd um, be willing to answer them. The reason I chose this is I think last week someone has suggested, someone was asking like, you know, a normal question. And I said, it is not um, possible to answer in a small way. I thought it will be good to address it i mean because usually we suppress it it's like you know it's okay um we don't have to address it but it is really necessary to address it when your body gives you symptoms it is a good thing to address it and not just keep suppressing it multivitamins cause acidity uh, again it depends on which time of the day you're taking it swati um and what kind of multivitamins also it could be, again, anything that you're giving inside the body can be converting into acid. That's one thing um, that can be happening because of that curd layer inside. So that could be the phenomena that's happening. So addressing addressing that first makes a lot of difference. Uh, we generally drink cold milk to suppress acidity, but I learned today that cold milk is also bad. Yeah, so you can take it just for that time but you have to reduce the frequency of taking it, right? You want to reduce the frequency. So just for that time, if you're really, really bad, and if, if it did not suppress with all of these that we just spoke about, then once in a while, you can take cold milk. You know, if you're used to taking it every week, you can probably take it once a month. But then in the long run, understand that you have to fix it. You have to understand that there is something inside that you have to work with. Um, uh, and this cold milk is also contributing to whatever is happening. So understanding that intellectually and you, if you still do it, it's okay. But then you have to also work towards addressing that undigested food inside. Yeah, it will definitely um, help you with suppressing the symptoms right away. Uh, chest muscle pain is also caused because of acidity. Yeah, like I mentioned, if the... If the type of uh, causative factors that we are giving is uh, because of a lot of air element, you know, if you are not sleeping on time, if uh, you're doing a lot of late nights, and if you're not giving enough food to the body, or if you're giving very much airy foods like popcorn, salads all the time, these foods can create a lot of air element in the body. And that kind of undigested food is present. If that's what's present, then it can lead to um it, it can lead to pains in the body 
So chest muscle pain can also be experienced at one point of time. I have a habit of taking milk tea and trying hard to stop from many years. It's okay. I mean, milk tea is okay. It's nothing uh, bad per se. But um, again, diluting the tea with milk, the Indian way of making chai um, is not written in the textbooks for sure. But uh, uh, it is, it is uh, if you do it along with some, you know, you can add a little bit of spices to it, like a cardamom. You can add a cardamom to it. You can add a cinnamon to it. You can add a clove to it. And then you can make the tea so that it's not... Uh, I mean, again, I'm saying this, hoping that there is no acidic problems that are you're experiencing already. If you're already experiencing acidity problems, then I wouldn't say yes to cinnamon and clove, but yes to adding milk to tea. And if you take it once in a while, yes, life is to have fun too. So it's okay if you're just having that. If you're just, that is your only weakness and you're able to conquer everything else, then milk tea should not stop you from conquering your acidity. You can have one or two things that uh, uh, you want to. That's okay. Yeah, late night is definitely. If you are uh, staying up at night, then the air element in the body increases. And because the air element in the body has increased, it will be difficult to digest the food. Salad you like. Yeah, so those are the things that uh, we have mentioned that can increase the air quality, air um, element inside. And that can be causing chest pain. That can be causing pain in the body. So it's important that you add good fats to your diet. Good fats meaning, again, making sure that you are able to digest well. Ghee is a good fat you can add. Milk, warm milk is a good fat that you can add. So if you can add these things, according, assuming that your digestion is working well, you can definitely overcome these problems. Again, reducing your late, late nights, making sure you're not doing that reducing your salads is the first thing once we know what the causative factor is reducing it is uh, the way to go yeah it was a very good discussion i um thank you all for joining i know it's a friday evening um i hope this time works for you all yeah i've been doing uh uh, 6 p.m. every Friday. I wasn't sure if this is still uh, work time. I know work has been pushed. Um, it is like you you never know what are work hours anymore because we're all working from home. Work hours are pushed. But then I thought Friday 6 p.m. is a sweet spot for everybody to join. And I have been trying to do that time every week. I'm hoping that that's the uh, time that can work for all of you also. But uh, as usual, you can let me know any other topic that you would like to listen next week and uh, i can talk about that or if there are any questions that are unanswered here in live you can always uh, direct message me and i'll be able to i'll try my best to answer them all as well the reason i come here is because there are a lot of direct messages and all the questions that are asked were asked in the past and if i come out here and be able to answer them a lot of uh, the doubts and queries will be um, addressed and that's why I um, come here every week I hope you'll make use of that and uh, let me know any other topics that you would like to listen in the future thank you all for the tips really enjoyed thank you so much for joining the stream yeah if that's it so we can uh, see you all next week have a great weekend all of you and see you all next Friday at 6 p.m. and you can if you have not already consider following Ayur Hitam on Facebook I try to give one, some or the other tips every day. I, um, at least from Monday through Friday, I put something, I post something on there. Um, you can definitely consider joining that. Ayur Hitam, A-Y-U-R-H-I-T-A-M. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bhargavi, for joining. And I'll see you all next week. Bye.